Hello Internet! So nice to see you. I got a great comment and I want you guys to listen to it. I'm wondering if all this debate stems from a terminology problem. Theory sounds like it's sort of removed from practice and is some sort of purely academic exercise. It also suggests a system of rules which confuses people. For example, am I allowed to play this note in this key? Music patterns, on the other hand, communicates both immediate practice utility and space for academic exploration. And does this without communicating that certain other things are illegal. No one would think that, for example, learning new drum patterns would turn you into a feelingless robot. And I suspect that people would feel the same way about learning new harmonic and melodic patterns. Whereby patterns, I mean, for example, perfect cadences, dominant substitutions, and things like that. This is a great point, and you guys will be surprised to know that. That's exactly how music theory used to be, but not in modern times. When all these things started, when we started playing music and teaching music, that's how music theory was. It was teaching patterns. And then in modern times, everything fell apart, and now we are stuck, in a sense, with this kind of horrible music theory that most people teach, that seems to be uh, cumbersome and full of rules and uh, full of prohibition and all this kind of thing. What happened? How did we get to this point? Well, let me tell you the story of the rise and fall of music theory. It all starts at the dawn of time, but let's get a bit closer to, uh, to, to our time. It all starts in the 1700s, during the Baroque era, when music theory was taught as music. There was no term music theory, there was no name music theory. Music theory meant nothing. Everything we know as music theory, the notes, the intervals, the relationship, counterpoint, etc., was taught as music. And it was part of a complete curriculum that contained both what we would call theory and what we would call practice. But it was a unified thing. People were not separating that. Now, if you wanted to learn music in the 1700s, you had two possible choices. You could learn music as a professional or as an amateur. And I want to stress that amateur did not have at the time any of the negative connotation that it has today. Amateurs were respected, okay? It was just, you had those two different paths. So, if you wanted to be a professional, you had to start when you were a kid, or at least very young. There were a number of institutions, the most famous one were um, the conservatories in uh, Naples, where essentially there were places where you put all the orphans, okay? A lot of people were dying at the time for very diff many different reasons. You had a lot of orphans and you were teaching, those, those people were teaching those kids music from a very early age with the idea to make them musicians. Musicians for them meant everything, meaning you're able to compose, you're able to improvise, you're able to become a human jukebox where you play music as a continuous stream out of you and you can keep playing and playing and improvising everything by yourself or in an ensemble. Okay, and you can also teach the whole package, okay? As a professional, the first three years of your instruction when you were a kid were spent only by singing. That was a great ear training, a bit radical if you want, but you were not allowed to touch an instrument unless you had three solid years of singing under your belt, and you could sing a number of things like scales, arpeggios, etc., etc., without even blinking, okay? You learned to read music by singing it, not by playing it, okay? And it was grueling, but it worked. And then gradually they were teaching you patterns, okay? And the patterns were very simple at the beginning, okay? Start, at the beginning, we're teaching simply, simply something like first chord, fifth chord, back on the first chord, what we would call tonic, dominant tonic, and then they were gradually making it more complex. Let's do this with a suspension. So I have C, G sus4, G, C again, and again, gradually making them more complex, okay? What if now I add, I add another chord in between? And then, okay, or I can add another, I can add this other chord. And then we're learning this, moving in all over the keys, improvising melodies on top, and all this kind of thing. And the whole thing was learning patterns exactly like the comment at the beginning of the video set. That was for the professionals. And when you learn all those patterns and learn to put them together, you have an immense vocabulary from which you can literally improvise anything. Those guys were able to sit down and write symphonies in days, not, not in years, okay? They were able to sit down and write, 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 write. Arrange things for any kind of ensemble, just using what they learn, using those patterns, okay? 
An amateur would have a slightly different curriculum. They would start learning the pattern and do a little bit of a little bit less singing, and they were not being so gung ho in moving them throughout all the keys and combining them in all those ways. So they were still able to do something, but not have the amazing ability that the professionals had at the time. That how it was in the 1700s. And again, nobody called it music theory. It was just music, as it should be, because learning all those patterns is just music. If I'm teaching you the pentatonic scale today, or if I'm teaching you the circle of fifth, or any kind of chord progression, jazz, pop, blues, whatever, it's not theory. It's what you actually do to make music. You need to know it, period, okay? It's not this, this super big theoretical thing that, that you never use. It's practical stuff. That's the way it was. Then, everything changed, okay? The, the, the scene of the music, the, the musical scene changed. There are a number of reasons for that. I'm not an historian, and even if I was, it's long to explain all the economic changes between the, 17, the, 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 the 1700 and the 1800, but everything changed, and musicians were not playing in courts anymore. They were, they were pretty much their own business, and the whole tradition of teaching changed. And so what happened is that there was still demand for professionals, but there was less people wanted to go through the whole course of becoming a professional musician because it was grueling to go through all these singing and playing the patterns and combining them. Fun up to a certain point, but not for 10 hours a day. Okay. And the amateur market changes too, and people start to be less interested in playing music but they become more interested in analyzing music and talking about music. So we have the rise of a different class, like musicians um, composing for bigger orchestra, stuff you cannot play on your piano at home, and there is less interest in playing this thing at home. There's more interest in going, listening to the concert, and having a conversation about that. This is also the period when the university start to build up in Europe. So we start to have the first university. The first university starts in the 1500s, but it starts to become common in the 1800s. And so, the first music courses were not, surprisingly, made to create professional musicians. The first secondary, post-secondary music courses, university, college music courses, were not made for people to become professional musicians. There were some courses that would help, that help you make becoming a professional musician, but you could graduate without knowing nearly anything about how to compose, and you could graduate taking all the courses that allow you to talk about music, analyze music, and become a good music critic. It's not surprising, if you think about it, that today we are still in the same situation. I know a number of people who graduate from the university or from colleges, and they know very little about making music, very little about actual theory and practical, and practical application of theory, but they can talk very expertly and, and they are very good music critics. There is nothing wrong with that. And I know that just by saying this on YouTube, I'm going to have a lot of haters. I don't care. That's the situation right now. At this point, we started talking about music theory, because when you want to study and critique what other people are doing, you want to distinguish between the executions of music practice and the compositions of music theory. And so we, we invented all those things about how to analyze music. So all this thing about tonic, subdominant, and dominant chord comes up in this period. All the analysis, okay, how to exactly name the chords, and also all, all the idea of analyzing everything in chords and chord progression come up in this period. While most musicians at the time were not thinking in chords or chord progression, they were mostly thinking in melodies and other kinds of patterns. Okay, so we have all these things. It was invented for music critics and gradually became the music theory we have today. No wonder that we cannot apply it to create music. But the original music theory is still there. It's very similar. It uses the same names. It's just taught in a different way. When we talk about music theory today, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about the original practice of music and all the patterns you can study to become better, okay? And every musician knows patterns. Whether you're a blues player playing the pentatonic over a blues chord progression, or a jazz player playing modes over, over, over chord progressions, or you, uh, or you improvise in different ways, you're a rock musician and no power chords. Those are all patterns that help you make the music you want to make. And there is this. But music theory also referred to all the other theories, which could be interesting in themselves, 
And it, it maybe they also help you make some very specific kinds of music, but they, are, they don't have this kind of general applicability or they're less practical than other music than the original music theory. So if you le want to learn all the set theory of music or you want to learn all the neo-Riemannian uh, relationship between chords, etc., you can, it's interesting, but it doesn't, it, it helps you analyzing a piece of music. It helps you much less in actually composing this piece of music and it helps you practically zero in improvising and making music in real time. I'm not saying there is no value in those things. I know I'm going to have some people commenting, I'm studying this super theoretical thing and I find it useful. I'm sure you do. The vast majority of the public looks at music theory and goes like, that's useless. And they are right. And they are completely right. That's the point. What I'm trying to do in this channel and in my courses, in my website, etc., is to teach you the real applicable music theory, because honestly, that's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in big theoretical um, uh, constructions and uh, geometry, sacred geometry of music and other stuff. It could be interesting, it's very aesthetic, it makes for nice diagrams, but I'm interested in actually making music. And that's the theory I teach. And that's the history of it. Originally, it was exactly that. Teaching patterns, learning patterns, putting them to practice. You guys can do whatever you want. If you want to become a musician, study the thing that makes you become a musician. If you want to talk about music and analyze, there is value in that. Study that, that thing. But be clear on what you want to become and do not mix those things. I am a guitar player. This channel is called Music Theory for Guitar. My audience is always guitar player. My point of view is always how we make music on this instrument. And the thing I see that stops most people, the biggest waste of time, the biggest bottleneck, okay, in your performance, I found is knowing where all the notes are on the guitar fretboard. Because unlike a piano, we don't have black and white keys, okay? So we need to learn where the notes are. It seems impossible until you do it. If you don't know how to do it, if you want help, if you want to invest five minutes a day for just a, for just a couple of months, two or three months, and learn all the notes of your guitar permanently with instant record, so it's not a problem anymore, I created a system and you can find it in video and ebook format on the link on the top right. It's completely free. Go there, download it, learn it, get better at playing guitar. Knowing where the notes are, it's super practical. It allows you to communicate faster with any other kind of musician and it supercharges your playing. Learn them, get better, learn the real music theory, become a better musician. This is Tomas Zilia of MusicTheoryForGuitar.com and until next time, enjoy.